Welcome to Growing a B2B SaaS. On this show, you'll get actionable and usable advice. You'll hear about all aspects of growing a business to a business software company. Customer success, sales, funding, bootstrapping, exits, scaling, everything you need to know about growing a startup and you'll get it from someone who's going through the same journey. Now your host, Joran Hoffman. Welcome back to another episode on the Grow Your B2B SaaS podcast, where we discuss all topics on how to grow your B2B SaaS, no matter in which stage you're in. In order to grow your SaaS, you will need to know what is working and what isn't. When done right, you would know which block would actually generate paid clients and what is a waste of money. Sounds easy, but it can be tricky and complicated to do. This is what you call revenue attribution. We're going to talk with Stefan Hedebrand today. He's a CMO and co-founder at Dream Data, and their tool helps B2B companies, and especially B2B SaaS companies, to attribute revenue. Before Dream Data, Stefan worked at Upwork and Airtime, where he scaled the businesses and teams really rapidly. So he knows the pains you are going through firsthand. Without further ado, welcome to the show, Stefan. Uh, thank you so much, Joran, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Nice. I'm always going to ask this at the at the beginning. Why should people listen to you today after this hearing this intro as well? That's a good question. I think I, I can make a promise that I'm not going to speak about stuff that I don't know about or haven't experienced myself. And that's a principle I always keep when I, I, I do podcasts or talk at events or something like that. I'm not going to rant about any sort of theory that I read on LinkedIn. I'll stay within something I've experienced myself and I relay that that story as good as I can because it's the truth as I see it and not somebody's feathers that I have borrowed somewhere else. Nice. I think that's a really good strategy. We're going to talk about revenue attribution today. In your own words, how would you define revenue attribution? And then especially with the context, of course, of being a B2B SaaS company. In the simplest of terms, it's understanding how your company gets new customers. What path are they taking? Is there a path that looks to be possible to replicate? Is there some cheat codes here that we can use again? Like I used to play a lot of computer games when I was younger and some games had cheat codes. And I look at it as the same way. If we understand what actually took place as we acquired a new customer, it's most likely that we can replicate the tactic so we can do more of it. And you can say the opposite side of the coin here is that we also want to help people do less of the things where they spend a lot of money, but no money comes back. And that is some of the revenue attribution. There's a bit of a, a fancy word for it, but it's just many marketing teams do a lot of activities where they're not able to actually prove in any sense that money came back from their activities. And not that you have to measure anything, but it's actually just spotting the things that absolutely do not work. Those money could be spent on something else and making it more likely that your SaaS company would well succeed ultimately yeah and, and what you said the money can be spent elsewhere on the things which are actually working which you also found out when you know what is working and then you can basically do more of that yeah before i guess companies even want to get started with revenue attribution what should minimal be in place before you can even think about this let's start super simple then there's nothing you have to do besides asking the questions in your team where did that customer come from starting to generate some curiosity about how can we tell a story about how this company arrived in our shop i think it starts there being curious about what is actually going on when we get a customer and once you start to have this conversation you can start thinking about simple techniques on the sales call you ask them where did you hear about us? You can have forms on your website that says, where did you hear about us? Then you can do simple stuff like installing Google Analytics on your website and like measures that are available for any from one person to many, many thousands of people. It's not rocket science that you start caring about how, where does your customers come from? But it's, I think, it's the best thing you can start to do initially. Exactly. Because in the end, if you know where they're coming from, you can start scaling that, of course. And it doesn't have to be complicated, as you mentioned. You can start really small with yeah. even having an onboarding, asking every call, hey, where did you actually find us? And in a previous podcast, people even said they, they went through the entire flow with a client. What did you actually type in? What did you search? And how did you actually find us? Which yeah. is a bit much, of course, but you can do that as well if you really want to go deep manual. Yeah. 
when do you really need to start thinking about this? Would you recommend doing this like really early stage already? Or is there something you might want to do later on? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I would say initially, it's much better to just do a lot of stuff rather than caring about analyzing what you did. Because like for any company, you will have to go through this cycle of a lot of experiments in the beginning to find out some sources that works, whether that's do a cold outbound calls or cold emails or run newspaper ads or do a podcast or whatever. You'll have to cycle through a lot of experiments. And before you start seeing those, some of them having leading indicators of something that looks attractive, then I wouldn't worry about analyzing anything. Initially, it's much better just to do a lot of stuff. Then once you get to some sort of scale where you need to make a decision on should we, we double the budget here? Should we hire somebody? Should we raise money, etc.? Then I think you should start considering whether you should get a more sophisticated setup. But there's a caveat here, which is the, like, when it, the same with data. It's kind of the best time to start tracking was when you started the company, because then you have the full history of anything that happened. And because if you decide today, then you'll have to look through, are we actually generating data of every digital interaction we have with our customers? And then it's going to be three or six months before the data is going to be valid because that's how long your customer journeys are. So it's a kind of, you want to start before you actually need it. So typical advice can just be to think about your customer journey and think about every step of it. Are we generating digital reflections of it that we can go back to at a later point? So it could be simple things if you don't have a CRM system where you work with your <laughs> your sales teams work with it. Maybe you should start getting a CRM system so you can see you had meetings, you had calls, <laughs> you sent mails, etc. It can be if you do customer success work in your Gmail inbox, then maybe get a customer success tool instead and so forth. Then there's probably many places where you are hand-holding stuff that you can move into a platform that helps you keep track of what's going on. Yeah, and I think the biggest advice here is if you want to do something later on that, and if you're going to scale and you know you're going to hire CS people, then add something in place already which collects the data. If you're going to hire sales people, add a CRM in place which actually collects the data so you know what is working at the moment when they actually join the company. Yeah. When we talk about acquisition, which is, of course, a lot of revenue attribution, like what are the most important metrics, in your opinion, to focus on when we talk about acquisition? It can be anything, right? So there's a lot of metrics you can track as a company, but in the end, of course, it goes regarding revenue, like how much revenue are you generating? So I guess, what do you think is going to be the most important things to track? If, if you can only track three things, for example, what would you track? Yeah, it obviously depends on which role you're at, but I think you, for most activities, most experiments, you probably want to both think about what could be a leading indicator, which is something that happens very fast. And then what could be a lacking indicator of something. So let's say we want to run, set up a new ad campaign on LinkedIn, then some very early leading indicators can be what is actually the engagement score of this ads like when we show it to somebody are they actually interested in it do they start clicking on it etc that is probably some of the early signals that you can see that you've set the right audience and the right messaging now that is just one thing because it just might be that you've made a super nice ad, but does it actually become sales pipeline later on, which is that would be then lacking indicators. Maybe you want to establish something that is not a one customer because that might take six months in a B2B SaaS. So you might rather just be wanting to monitor, do we get more demo calls booked uh, when we start running these, uh, these ads? So I, I think in popular terms, any marketer today would say you need to measure revenue on your marketing activities. And that's true. And that's what we, what our tool enables people to do. But you should also have ideas about what is leading indicators of something working. And if you're in doubt whether it works, you can go look here and then quickly spot whether you should like change the experiment a little bit and try something else. Yeah, because as you mentioned, revenue can come in maybe six months later. So yeah. something needs to happen before, before, of course, it actually turns into revenue, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we released these benchmarks last year about our customers' customer journeys. And the average there, which is predominantly B2B SaaS companies, was from first touch to a deal being won, was 192 days in average. So more than six months. 
So it does take a lot of patience in B2B if you want to wait for revenue. And that's also why I argue for you coming up with proxies or like leading indicators that, that your activity is taking you on the right path. And is there also any insights as in what is the average deal size then of that benchmark? I think that doesn't make too much sense to look at because companies are so different in that sense. Like we have anything from like $100 subscriptions per month to seven, seven figure deals coming in as well. Yeah, because I think the assumption is always that the smaller the deals, the quicker they go. Actually, now that you say it, I think we did bucket the revenue size also to compare to the time it takes. Yeah. So if we go towards like companies are already doing revenue attribution, what is the most common mistake companies making while doing this? Yeah, so if we look at the landscape today of about what our markets is doing, I think there's three places that they are looking and they're being misled. One is Google Analytics, which has been around for ages now and is completely misleading people because it's absolutely not built to understand what's going on in a B2B company. If you're selling simple transactional e-commerce stuff, it might be valuable. But in B2B, we're facing these six or 12 months journeys, multiple people involved in the deal and anywhere between 30 and 100 sessions on the website before you buy. And that means that Google Analytics can not help us in any way understanding what's going on. Then there's the, all the ad platforms where we buy our ads. They are completely blinded beyond telling us you bought a click and at best that click converted in the session when they arrived to our website. But what can we really use that was some email converted on a website for? We need to understand who is it, which part of, which account are they part of, did that account become sales pipeline, etc. And ad platforms have no clue about this. And then the last in this rant, the CRM system is also regarded as some place to find the truth. But it's very useless <laughs> as well for B2B marketers. But it does have, a lot of them have this original source or lead source kind of field that is updated when a conversion comes in. The problem, though, is that one, that field can very typically be updated manually. So the BDR can say, hey, that was me, my call, and it might turn out that it wasn't the truth. An example is that when we have a demo call booked, there's an average of four sessions involved before the, uh, the call is booked. The CRM will say, in this session, the conversion happened, and you came in directly. So I'll write the original source was direct. But what typically happens is that journey doesn't start out of nowhere. It's, it starts with a marketing activity, whether that's an affiliate or a paid marketing or organic search or something else. So the CRM is always bound to over-represent direct visits or BDRs that says, I called this person and I got a meeting booked. So the situation right out there, if you ask me, is very critical. And that I think that what we're trying to evangelize through podcasts like this is what people don't know what they don't know right now. So we need to help them understand how they can do it better. Yeah, because in, in the end, these systems now currently don't talk to each other. And as you mentioned, like they're really focused towards their own metrics like the app platforms and of course google analytics not being fully ready to be SaaS, and then you're relating on manual work from the sdrs which of course like is bound to make mistakes yeah and it's the same for your affiliate business as well if the customers become aware about a company through you but don't convert in the first session and then they come back four or five times directly or through retargeting or something else then you get zero credit for it despite the first time that the client heard about you was through some kind of a, a, a affiliate collaboration. Yeah. And in our case, we still work with first party cookies, so they will get attributed because they we set a cookie period and then that's yeah. what the SaaS can decide. So that still nice. like works really nice. So in the end, like we even recommend our clients to run retargeting ads so they actually retarget the traffic and affiliate generates. So it might be like a combined effort. In yeah. the end, it wouldn't be a client if they have not done that. So that's one thing. But when we talk about, I guess this is a process which isn't working. Can you share some strategies, processes you've used to attribute revenue correctly? And this can be a bit more towards, I guess, what you guys do at Dream Data as well. Yeah, you can say we do it as a service, but I can describe the components you need to get in place if you want to do it yourself. B2B uh, go-to-market is complex and there's a lot of data we need to capture. Ideally, you want to have as much data about your customer journey as possible available. That would typically involve what takes place in your CRM system, what takes place through marketing automations, what takes place through outbound software and customer success software. 
that's typically the tech stack you need to cover. Then you need to track anything that is going on your website and store that in a data warehouse where you have access to it and you own it first party. Then you need to understand all the marketing activities you did uh, on all the ad platforms. And once you've set up tracking on all these places, then you need a way to identify anonymous people with who they actually are. And you can say that's one of the first places it, it gets tricky. One thing is that you need to understand whether this anonymous ID has a computer, a tablet, and a phone. That those you need to resolute <laughs> to the same person. And you also need to be able to, once that they then convert, push through a form, you need to be able to take their identity, who you now know who are, is, and resolute that with all the other visits that they had on your website before converting. So now we have one user knowing who they are. Then you need to, in your data model, you need to then sort the user to the account that they belong to. Because ultimately, we want to build a timeline of every account and not just of every individual. So we can go into every account and look like when was the first time we heard about this account and when did the account buy? And this is the process you need to go through finding a mechanism where you can take, where you can build an account based timeline and not an, a timeline of, of individuals. Once you got that timeline established, then you would want to connect the whole timeline to money, to revenue, and that typically is done through the CRM system where you take, what did we close one here? Because that enables you to take the account-based timeline and say all the touches we have here, does that yield money or does it not yield money? So that is the, I think, the non-technical description of what you technically need to do. Yeah, and I think this is why a tool like Green Data exists, right? Because if you have to do this yourself as a SaaS founder, as a marketer, then probably you wouldn't be able to do this or you need so much development time that you're actually building the tool probably like Dream Data. Yeah, and to be honest, it's all, uh, it also takes very specialized people that actually know what they're doing and to know what problems they're going to run into and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, that, that would be our argument for buying a service to, to keep this in place for you rather than, than doing it yourself. Yeah, nice. If we, you mentioned, I guess, the benchmarks, and of course you have access or you have a lot of clients where you can see exactly what is working and what isn't working. When we talk about what is working really well, is there something you can say based on any of the data you have? Yeah, I could mention a few, like a few of the things that, that does well and doesn't do well <laughs> across many accounts. One thing could be to mention review websites in the, those benchmarks that people can go look at. You'll see that the journeys that start through review websites tends to be around 65% faster than other journeys. So if you come from a review website, then it's a lot faster. So that means the takeaway here for you is to think about what industry am I in? Are there review platforms? Are we actually ranking nicely? Does our profile there actually look nice? Because it's people who are in market that are checking these review websites. And if we're not doing well there, we're missing out on some very hot leads that we could be capturing to our company. I think that's component one. Then if we take something that is really crappy, then Google Display Network, any activity there that is not retargeting tends to be just a complete waste of money. I have at least not come across anybody who have done any kind of acquisition tactic of going to cold audiences there and actually succeeding, getting some metrics that, that looks attractive. That's interesting because it does work, but purely for retargeting. That's a... Of course, it's not categorically true, but I've at least not seen it. Uh, and one question maybe regarding the first point you said, review websites go 6% faster. Like when you look at B2B SaaS, do you also have the knowledge as in which review sites work really well? Of course, you have G2, Trustradius, Captera, yeah. Techbon. Are there any platforms for B2B SaaS companies working really well? Yeah, we use Captera and, and G2 ourselves. Captera has that advantage that they have a PC model. So you can, you can buy your way on top of the rankings, which is, you can say is somewhat contradictory to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to what the purpose of it is. But if you're completely new in a market or on Captera, then it's a way to get some actions <laughs> quickly. We can see, I think I, I took a look here the other day on, on the deals we win. I think 50% had been on our G2 profile. So it can have a massive impact on your business if it's something that you actually put some efforts into. Nice. Yeah. 
it's overall good practice, right? To ask your clients to leave you a review. So definitely make sure you always do. It's one of the things we personally do. For example, when people come and chit chat and they're happy, then I, it's an easy ask as well. Hey, would you mind spending 10 minutes to give us a review? It's just, it's all about making the next sale a little bit easier. Yeah. If there's just one more review, then the next sale that you're going to go for, is just going to be a little bit easier because there's one more person voting that you can be trusted, that you're a good, good partner. And I think that's like when we talk about B2B marketing in general, I think people tend to forget that there's only one success for B2B marketing, and that is when we sell more (laughs) in in our company. So we need to do anything we can to make the life easier for money to to come into our business. Exactly. Exactly. Nice. Maybe a last thing to pick is that when it comes to, to search, it's most of the times it's a waste of time chasing really broad keywords because people that search for these really broad keywords have zero intention of acquiring a tool like you do and that's that goes both for search ads or for organic search you're much better off going what you would call long tail or very deep into the customer journey and do something some content there that is super strong about that rather than picking that very broad keyword that has zero purchasing intent behind it yeah in when you look at a really practical it makes sense right because your ideal customer profile is looking for something really specific and the more wider you go i guess the wider you make your on uh, not your icp but you're going to go out of that bucket yeah. you're going to have people on your site which are not actually looking for what you're offering yeah and then if you're not careful then those people also fill up your uh, targeting cookies and then you're going to be spend, spending money on retargeting these people who have no interest in buying your product and then it's exactly. just a, a bad spiral from there yeah because in the end retargeting and then they might even book a demo because they think it's going to be relevant and then they're going to take up sales time like we had yeah. it at the beginning <laughs> ourselves as well where we had a lot of unqualified things and we made some changes because I was doing the demos and which is taking myself way too much time to actually jump on those. So definitely be pressure for everybody's time. Growing a B2B SaaS is tough. We know. This is why we started Redditus. We help you to grow your monthly recurring revenue without high upfront costs. How? By leveraging someone else's network and only giving away a commission when they deliver you a paid client. It's called affiliate marketing. It's already a really cost-effective and scalable revenue channel. We even made it better for you. With Redditus, you can start for free and only start paying us when you generate revenue. Learn more at www.getredditus.com. When you talk about, I guess, like marketing and sales alignment, as in, there's of course a hot topic always, but now you're basically doing revenue attribution, right? So you're doing the attribution, like where is it actually coming from? How does it also help to align sales or marketing to make sure that you actually attribute the revenue towards the right channel? Yeah, I think here it's actually about enabling marketers to look beyond the first conversion so they can analyze what they've done in a perspective of did it generate sales pipeline or customers that we want. So instead of being super tightly focused on marketing, just generating more email addresses, you can help them move their scope to let's do more of the activities that generated a sales pipeline. And that shift becoming focused on generating revenue makes marketing do activities that are focused on providing high quality demand for the sales team rather than just being stuck measuring how many emails did we collect this month. And (laughs) coincidentally, that makes the salespeople very happy because the marketing team is focused on bringing really qualified demo calls that are more likely to buy your product yeah in the end it's super simple right focus on the same metrics have the same goal in mind and then people are going to align like naturally exactly i think so that that's at least one metric i think in general it's something that any company should strive to to do better and better and that means you cannot complain and say oh the salespeople are stupid or the marketing team is stupid you need to get off your seat and then walk into the room and tell them if you're a salesperson this is how a good lead looks like. This is our best customers. This is the easiest. So the marketing team knows. Or if the salespeople is not showing up, then as a marketing team, you walk into the room and ask, is there anything we can help you with or anything we can do better or something you think we do wrong? 
<laughs> or let's go drink a beer and learn how your work is being done. Talk to each other. I think that's the main clue here. We are coming a bit to the end and I always like to ask these two questions at the end. So when we talk about revenue attribution, what kind of advice would you have for SaaS founders in two different stages, starting with somebody who's starting out and growing to 10K monthly recurring revenue? So like starting out, I would just focus on doing a lot of activities and run on a critical gut feeling, like just do some stuff and look at what are the leading indicators here that this is probably true. And if there's something that where you're in doubt whether it works or not, then it's probably not working. Exactly. So do a lot of things and then figure out what is actually working. and what is Just based out of your gut feeling and scratching the surface, because it's much better to like keep a high activity level at that point. Yeah, and I think the one thing you mentioned at the beginning as well is make sure that you do ask, for example, in the sales calls, in the form, in the onboarding, yeah, where yeah, you're exactly. coming from. So at least you have some begin data to, to start with. There's also a good conversation topic for any sales call. Why are you here? Yeah. How did you hear about us? And so forth. Yeah, I still do it often. And often they, they forgot about it already or they saw, oh, I saw your face on LinkedIn, but I also mm. saw your product out there. I also saw you there. So it's hard to put it back, but it's always a good question to ask because then you know what is and what not. When we move on, so we go past that 10K MR and we're going to make a huge step towards 10 million ARR. What kind of advice would you give SaaS founders here? Yeah, and then I would give SaaS founders particularly, I would tell them to ask their teams about how what they are doing in their team is helping your company make more money and continuously challenge this this narrative or this explanation. So if you're a sales team, then ask them, how are you generating money? How is the marketing team generating money? So the whole company gets curious about how this process looks like. And then hopefully some of the smarter cookies out there would then say, I must be some kind of technical solution to this question. But I think the most important thing is just being super both curious and, and, ambis and ambitious about understanding how do we generate revenue and what can we do more of to generate more revenue. Yeah, nice. The I guess the final question, what is, and this could be more general, like what is one thing you wish you knew 10 years ago? I think it's the, the fact that most marketing tactics stop working at some point. So that means that when something works, you really need to double down at that very moment because it's going to stop working at some point. Any Most things works like an auction. So the more competition there is, the less it star, starts working. And that, that goes from Google ads to Facebook ads to LinkedIn ads to podcasts, etc. It has its honeymoon days and then people tell each other that it works and then it doesn't work anymore. So there's one thing, go super deep while it's working, but also make sure to plant a few seeds here and there. So they are ready to prosper once the original source uh, stopped working. Yeah, and I think that's a bit the hustle phase you mentioned at the beginning. Keep trying new things or keep trying things. So don't always stick to it. But it's, it's, very, it's a fine line because also when you find something that works, you also really need to pay attention and double down on it because that's what's going to pay for all the other experiments. So you can't just run away once you find something that works and try other stuff. You really need to keep drilling <laughs> once it's working. But yeah. just be aware that it's going to stop working at some point and then you would wish that you had some small experiments running on the side. Exactly. Nice. Cool. If people want to get in contact with you, Stefan, how would they, what would be the best way to do? Yeah, that, that, that would definitely be a bit LinkedIn so they can just connect and I'll be happy to answer most questions. And make sure you probably mention that you're going to come from this podcast because otherwise... <laughs> yes, please mention that. Because in the end, I have not to brag, but 200 open invitations with people who wants to offer all their services to me. Oh. So it's make sure you mention something in the in the invitation. Cool. Thank you for coming on. I think for people who really want to get started with this, like Dream Data does have a free trial where you can track up to 30,000 monthly users. We... Before I, I jumped on this call, I actually signed up this week oh, to get nice. Stream Data started. So for us as well, this is a topic I wanted to address because we're actually experiencing it right now. So I guess I'm doing the pitch for you. Sign up for Dream Data <laughs> if you actually want to get things started. Thank you again for coming on to the show, Stefan. My pleasure. Thank you, Aaron. No worries. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Growing a B2B SaaS. Yoran has been ahead of customer success before founding his own startup. He's experiencing the same journey you are. We hope you've gotten some actionable advice from the show. And we hope you had fun along the way. We know we did. 
Make sure to like, rate, and review the podcast in the meantime. To find out more and to hook up with us on our social media sites, go to www.getreadinous.com. See you next time on Growing Up B2B SaaS.